All right. That way we'll have a recording of this presentation and we'll post that to our website so you can refer back to it later. Um, everybody welcome. This is the 2024 um, Kansas Heritage Trust Fund Grant Workshop. My name is Katrina Ringler. I am the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer and the Director of Cultural Resources Division. Um, formerly the grant administrator for um, the Kansas Historical Society. Um, we are introducing today Jan Schubert Eric, who is our new grants manager, and she is going to present the workshop today. Um, I'll be here to answer questions. And you can see Lauren Jones is in the background. She's another one of our staff members, our survey and outreach coordinator, and she's going to be helping with the chat and answering questions and um, letting you guys speak if you raise your hand or let us know that you want to ask a question. Um, feel free to do that as we go along, but there'll also be time at the end to, to answer questions too. So I'm going to let Jan take it away. Hello, everyone. It's um, so good to be here at the Kansas Historical Society and managing the Heritage Trust Fund grant this year. So let's get started. The um, HTF program, as we call it, the Heritage Trust Fund, was created in the 1990s by this Kansas State Legislature and has funded over three, $30 million of preservation work across the state. This fun, these funds come from the uh, per page fee collected by the Register of Deeds in each of your counties, no county paying more than $30,000 per year toward that fund. But the statute mandates that the funds must be dispersed across the state and half must go to cities, counties, and historical societies. And this is an excellent program. It's an opportunity for the Kansas Historical Society to support um, pr local preservation efforts across the state of Kansas. So this year, applicants can ask for up to $100,000. We have a million dollars approximately to award in grants. A minimum award would be $5,000 and reimbursement would be up to 80% of the costs. You would provide the 20% match unless you were a for-profit corporation, in which case that would be 50% on each side, 50% match, 50% award. So who's eligible for these funds? Eligible properties included properties listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Register of Historic Kansas Places, or listed as a contributing structure in a listed district. State and federally federal government owned properties are not eligible. So if you are not sure about your status, you would check the KHIR database or just call us and we can help you do that. Eligible applicants. Applicants must own the property and provide proof of that ownership. Owners must consent to the application in writing Examples of ownership types include private individuals, nonprofit organizations, local county governments, or for profit corporations. If there's more than one owner, all property owners must agree in writing to apply for the grant and include that documentation with the application. Properties owned by boards or trusts or commissions should include documentation of a vote approving the HTF application. For-profit corporation owners must demonstrate that the property's continued existence is actually threatened or that the property's rehabilitation, rehabilitation is not economically feasible without an HTF grant. Eligible grant project activities include rehabilitation work, for example, upgrading mechanical systems or remodeling bathrooms, etc., or restoration work, reconstructing missing features on a building, for example, and you must have documentation of these features over time. Preservation work. 
maintain, repair historical materials or activities to halt deterioration, erosion control of archaeological sites. Non-construction activities include the preparation of historic structure report, maintenance plans, or construction plans, but all work must conform to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. While all of these activities are eligible for application and awards, some are more successful than others. In general, proposals to repair and preserve the exterior envelope of a building compete much better than projects to simply update an already stable and sound building. Remember that no work shall begin on the project until the grant awards are announced in February 2024. The grant administrator has attended an orientation session with the SHPO staff and the owner has signed a grant agreement. There are lists of eligible activities. Some of them include additions to buildings, interpretive displays, equipment purchases, major reconstructions, acquisition of property, and usually the relocation of structures is not el are not eligible, but possible. Grant administration expenses and general maintenance. Keep in mind that there are certain things um, that all property owners are expected to do toward maintaining their historic buildings. For example, cleaning gutters and touching up paint would be two examples. You can find additional ineligible activities in the 2024 HTF program information document. And there's a link to that on our website, which I'll show you in a bit. The HTF grant is a reimbursement program. This is the most important thing for you to remember. Grantees must maintain cash flow and pay consultants and contractors per their contracts with them. We cannot pay contractors or consultants directly. Documentation of payment is required when you request reimbursement from SHPO. We would want photos, copies of invoices, and copies of uh, proof of payment from you. Reimbursement requests are always processed as quickly as possible. So remember, the grantee will pay 100% of all the invoices as they become due. And HTF will reimburse the grantee at the 80% level or 50% for for-profit corporations. So after the awards are announced, grantees will sign a project agreement. This agreement defines the scope of work, the schedule, the reimbursement criteria, and any other conditions of the grant award. Your grant administrator will attend a grant orientation session. And the project, usually the grant administrator, will submit monthly progress reports to SHPO during the life of the grant. Remember that no project work may begin until this project agreement is signed. The project administrator has attended the workshop orientation session, actually, and um, the competitive bidding process is followed. Um, work generally won't begin any sooner than the summer of 2024. So here are the deadlines. The grant application is online now, <clears throat> excuse me, and will be due by midnight of no on November 1st, 2023. You can find program information on our website. The grants will be announced on February 20, um, actually February 3rd, 2024 at the Historic Sites Board of Review meeting. So you will, um, and I'll, I'll go through this with you in a bit and show you our website page, but um, you'll be submitting the application by November 1st. You will be able to save a draft uh, and continue that process um, later. You can save and go back into it. 
but you can only add attachments at the very end of the application process. We strongly encourage you to consider setting up a Word document where you can place all of the answers to the grant questions on a separate document and then copy and paste back into the application. And this way your work is saved, perhaps your notes are saved, and you can go back and refer to that at a later date. And um, your application that you've started won't be lost. If for some reason you lost a link to that application once you start it, we won't be able to retrieve that for you. So that's very important to remember. So HDF application materials. Um, there is a, a um, program information document on the website that has a lot of information in it that you'll wanna read before you begin answering your questions. And the um, application itself, you'll want to read it through carefully before beginning filling out the form. And it will be submitted online through the form stack platform, which is a new platform for us. <clears throat> so here's what the application looks like. Well, you should be, I'm, just, I'm sorry, you should begin on the Heritage Trust Fund page on the Kansas Historical Society website. And the address is here, www.kshs.org slash 14617. So start there, read about the program. And then if you click on the 2024 HTF program information, you'll have, be able to download that document and use that for future reference. Then you'll notice there's a submit button for the application down in the lower left-hand corner. If you press the, click on the submit your application button, that will take you into the actual application. So that's Jan, what you want to do to begin. Yes. Jan, we had someone who had um, a question here. Let me see if I can get to them. Okay. Let them speak. Um, Lisa, um, I think you should be able to talk to us if you'd like. Yes. Uh, my question, I you already answered it. So I just I was impatient and I needed to wait for you to explain. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. That's okay. okay. Thank you. That means uh -huh. you're really interested, Lisa. So that's good. Okay. So this is what the intro page of the application looks like. You'll find out if your property is listed on the National Register or the State Register, Kansas, Register of Historic Kansas Places. Um, you'll go to the website and read the information. And then this information note, that's very important. Attachments will not remain attached if you are saving this form to compete to complete it later. Please add attachments only once you are ready to sign and submit the application. Each submission is restricted to a total upload size of 25 megabytes. So that's very important to remember as you think about <clears throat> photographs or letters of support and things you are adding to your application. You have a limit of 25 megabytes. So you need to plan ahead. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and if necessary, please ask us for help. Okay, so the first part of the grant is very self-explanatory. The name of the property owner, that address, email address of the property owner, and phone number. The legal um, owner of the property will be as of November 1st, 2023, and will remain the owner throughout the duration of the project plus five years from the date of the project closeout. If the property has more than one owner, all parties must provide proof of agreement with the application and if funded agreement with the project agreement. You are required to provide proof of current ownership. Section B is historic property information. In the KHRI database, you will find the historic property name for your property. This is the name that we would like you to use. And um, 
you see the address for the KHIR database. I can send anyone um, the uh, this PowerPoint for future reference if you like as well. That might make it easier for some of you. So don't worry, we'll, follow, we'll figure it all out. Historic property address, the name of the county of the property, where the property is located and your congressional district. <clears throat> Section C, <clears throat> your grant administrator. Name of your grant administrator, the mailing address, your email address, and the phone. You want to have one point of contact on the project if it receives funding. So make sure that the grant administrator has the skill sets and the interests to maintain um, communication between SHPO and your project. This should be someone um, who can work with the project team and the HTF staff and keep records and provide monthly progress reports to SHPO and someone you, who you expect will remain throughout the entire project. This is the person who would attend the orientation session once the grants are announced. So think carefully, who will be your grant administrator? And in this box, you will tell us why this person would serve that function well. Does this person have past experience managing grants or project management? Is this person a good communicator, for example? Does the person understand what the project entails? Section D is applicant status. Select the category that best describes the property owner. Are you an individual, a city or county government, a not-for-profit organization, or an unincorporated business, or a for-profit corporation, or other? And if so, um, other, explain to us, and maybe contact us ahead of time, too, so we can discuss that with you. If you're not sure, check with us. Historic property status. If the property is listed, please select the listing category below. Is it a National Historic Landmark? Is it in the National Register of Historic Places? Or only on the State Register, the Historic Kansas Places? Or is it a contributing property in a historic district? And if you select the contributing property in a historic district category, you will another box will open up and it will ask you the name of the historic district. So you would enter that there. Next question, does the property owner intend to apply for federal and or state historic tax credits for this project? So this is something that would be very helpful for us to know ahead of time and to get you going in the right direction and on the right time schedule. So you, you might intend to apply for both federal and state tax credits. You might intend to apply only for state, or you may not attend, uh, intend to plan, apply for either, or you may already have an open uh, tax credit project. These boxes that you will open up have a limited character. Um, so, for example, this box you can use, you can type in a thousand characters and you would briefly describe your project. Try to be as succinct as possible and um, make it clear so the grant reviewers will know exactly what you are intending um, this project to include. So this next question has 4,000 characters. So we want, would like a little more information. Explain how this property is unique as compared to other historic properties. Remember, you are competing against quite a few um, grant applicants. So the, the um, more uh, information you can put here, the story, tell us about the property, the events that took place, significant people, its part in local, state, or national history. Um, help us understand, help the grant reviewers understand the importance of your project 
and convince them that um, you have planned and will be able to implement a successful project. Public benefit, a very important question. This is by state statute. Um, our application um, includes this question because um, we need to know if this is funded through the Heritage Trust Fund, how is it going to benefit the local community and the state? Um, summarize the um, support for your project, and then later you'll be able to upload up to six letters of support um, that show, um, demonstrate this to the grant reviewers. Think carefully about who you will have on write letters of recommendation for the project. You might want to pull on heartstrings. What does this building, what does this place mean to people over time? Why is it important that this project be funded? Provide a brief explanation of how the historic property will be used once the grant funded work is complete. What are the long-term plans for the property and the goals of the property owner? Current condition and preservation work needed. Explain the current condition of the property and how it came to be in the condition that it's in. Prioritize the preservation work needed and most the most urgent needs. Why is funding critical now? And you have 4,000 characters to tell us that. Again, state statute um, that created this grant requires the grant committee to consider the condition and the urgency of the preservation work proposed. Often urgency, uh, this urgency um, topic piece is most critical because um, why would we recommend funding if, if the um, project isn't in urgent need of support because the, this is such a highly competitive grant. So every question must be answered. Tell us your condition of it and talk to us about urgency. Also in question section J is about in how the property is endangered. You can cite available documentation. You might have architectural um, drawings, engineering studies, um, Tell us, exp tell us how the um, project will protect the property. Um, is the property threatened by development? Is there erosion that's taking place? Is there water coming in the building? Is there a wall that's about to collapse? Um, why is it important that this project be funded this year through the HTF grant? Sources of funding. Explain why HTF funds are being requested. Describe past expenditures made by the applicant toward the repair and maintenance of the project. Have you utilized other grants, other types of uh, funds for repairs, maintenance of the project over time? What sources are available for funding for this project that you are now talking about? Are you applying for any other grants or loans? Are there friends groups that support this or other um, funders of some sort? Are you using tax credits? If this project is not eligible for other types of funding, please tell us why. So here, describe what other funding is available and if it's ineligible. So you have a thousand characters in that box then um, how much cash funding is available to you for paying invoices as they become due? Because you're doing the, this is a reimbursement grant, we need to be assured that you will be able to have the necessary cash flow for the project. Please describe how the funds are currently held and when you will be able to access them. A 20% match is required for most applicants, 50% for not for the for-profit corporation. Grantees will need enough cash on hand to pay invoices as they become due and then seek reimbursement from us for at least one project 
line item that is complete. Please provide documentations of your available funds in the upload area below. So you get to tell us all about how you're going to cash flow your project. You might have documentation such as promises of a loan or bank statements, um, funding coming from other sources. You could upload letters or explanations. Um, so we understand. So the next section is your budget. Please list project line items um, addressed by the grant if awarded. Provide estimated total costs for each line item. And you can go ahead at this point in time and go ahead and get your estimates and seek your letters of support and get started in that way. At least um, one budget line item must be 100% complete before a grantee can seek um, reimbursement from SHPO for that line item. For example, a roof project generally cannot be broken into smaller amounts or separate line items. So you wouldn't apply for reimbursement for your roof repair until the roof was entirely done. However, if you're working on windows from different sides of the building, you might be able to say, I, I need this much money for the north windows or the south side windows and, um, and then apply for reimbursement as each elevation of the building um, is complete. So this is just an example for you that shows those line items, a subtotal. The contingency is 20% of the construction costs. That's how that's calculated. So a total budget of 78,000 and you, this applicant would come in at $62,400 on a $78,000 project. So this just shows you how you will enter um, the budget line items, a roof, a window, tuck pointing, whatever it is, and then the estimated costs on each line associated across from left to right. And there's one more. So there's six line items possible here. And then that will subtotal as your construction costs. And then it will calculate 20% for the contingency. And then you have, um, if you are using a, a consultant and you want that consultant to be paid through the HTF grant, you would enter that cost, that fee here. That's not required, of course. Only if you want it, only if you're using a consultant or professional like an architect and then um, expecting it to be paid through the grant. So then you have your total project costs and then your grant request. If you are anyone but a for-profit, it would be 80% of that total project cost. Contingency funds are not related to the 20% match. That's important to remember. They are added to the budget to provide a cushion in case of unforeseen challenges like higher than expected bids and unknown deterioration within the building materials, uh, things that might be exposed as the project moves along. This, this form automatically calculates, so you don't have to do this math. It will do it for you as long as you have your line items. Um, entered. Okay, the HTF grant application attachments and submissions. After you have completed the entire application, answered all of the questions, you may then attach the required materials. Attachments will only remain to on the application if you are saving them um, if you are attaching them at the very end, right before you sign it electronically and submit the application. And remember, you can only upload up to 25 megabytes. And this is where you will attach your evidence of property ownership. It might be a, um, a letter from your county appraiser, it might be a copy of your current deed, et cetera. So you must prove to us that um, 
you own the property and that this document must actually have the legal description of your property on it. And then you will upload your documentation of funding available. And this relates back to section K, showing that you can cash flow the project. These files must can be must be submitted in J, basically JPEG or PDF formats. And then you will have your letters of support, up to six of them. So think carefully about who you want to have, um, have support your project, what is going to make an impact um, on the grant reviewer when the grant reviewer is looking at your application and comparing it to many other applications. Uh, letters with a personal connection to the property generally have a greater impact than, say, maybe a letter from a local politician. And then photographic documentation. You can provide up to 20 images of the property included in a single PDF document. These images should illustrate the existing conditions and concerns addressed in this application. But one image should be the pretty picture, the overall view of the front elevation of the property building. Um, the remaining images are at, the, at your discretion. Oops. And remember, a 25 megabyte limit. If you need help, ask. The assurances. So when you apply for these funds, you, you will agree that you will do certain things. And I won't read all of these, but um, you agree to um, all of the process of uh, the grant agreement, uh, attending a grant orientation session. You agree that you will have sufficient you have sufficient funds to um, cash flow the project that you will um, provide us with the contracts and our process for going out to bid and so forth. We work with you step-by-step step along the way to make sure that all of your um, invitations to bids, your contracts, et cetera, are all um, within the requirements of this grant. Oh, one other thing, you also agree to um, own the property for then, I believe it's five years from the grant. And your signature. Okay, so then we'll go to a little bit about project budget planning. When can you come back to SHPO to ask for reimbursement? Um, you're spending a lot of money and um, it's a lot to manage maybe, but um, this is when you can come back. You can come back and, and file a reimbursement request when a line item is 100% complete as outlined in the grant agreement document that we'll work with you on at the beginning of the grant award. All work must follow the Secretary of the Interior standards, and you must provide photos of the work that show that um, the work has been completed. Sometimes we do site visits as well. You must provide us with proof of paid invoices, receipts, statements, copies of checks, etc. You cannot ask for reimbursement for setup fees, material purchases, and partial work. Those are not eligible for reimbursement through this program. So your project, um, say your project includes window rehab. It is recommended that you um, divide line items by the number of windows rather than by uh, phases of the window work. So <clears throat> say, for example, like we were talking before, you say there are six windows on the north side that are going to be rehabbed. And so that's $10,000 and six windows on the south. And so not recommended is a process where you would say you're going to remove all 12, repair 12, and reinstall. And um, it might be easier for the contractor, but it might 
um, and it might cost you more to do it um, this way, but we can only reimburse you for completed work. So we'll work with you on um, these line items and try to think about it so it's it's logical and think um, when you are going to need the money and um, how that process might flow according to your project needs. Okay, so say your contractor completes the west side windows and invoices you for $10,000. You, your contract with your contractor, you can hold up, we suggest that you have a 10% retainage. That's your leverage over um, working with your contractor to complete the project. So you would pay your contractor at that point $9,000. So you come back to SHPO for reimbursement and you show us the $10,000 invoice. You show us proof of payment for the 9,000 and HTF reimbursement is 80% of the 10,000 would be 8,000 and the retain our retainage on our end that we hold until the end of the project would be 800 of 10% of 8,000 is 800. So at that point in time, we would reimburse you $7,200 on your invoice for 10,000 that you paid 9,000 on. So it's not 100% at the beginning, you know, step by step. And so it's just something for you to think about as you think about your cash flow. Attention, seeking competitive bids is a requirement of this program for any product or service estimated at $5,000 or above. Non-competitive directly negotiated contracts may be approved on HTF um, by HTF staff on a case-to-case -case basis. So um, because this grant is a match for federal funding, other federal funding that comes um, to SHPO, we have to follow the same grant requirements as federal funding. So. Um, if you are seeking assistance of a consultant or qualified contractor, the procurement of professional and construction services must be carried out in a manner consistent with the HTF policies described in the project agreement to be signed by the grantee. The required bidding process is outlined in Appendix A and Appendix B at the end of the program information handout. Seeking competitive bids is a requirement of this program. So um, non-competitive directly negotiated contracts um, can be um, worked uh, with through SHPO on a case-to-case -case basis. Okay, an invitation to bid. Basically, what needs to be done, you write it up, um, you get approval from us on the, on the document, um, who is qualified to do it, you invite them to bid on it, you post it. Um, we have a listserv we can post things on, notices on, if you would like. Um, you give them time to reply to your invite. You evaluate the responses and make a decision. And you send documentation to SHPO and a draft contract to us to review. And you get our approval. And then you sign a contract. And then you remember that SHPO will need copies of all the signed contracts that you have for your project. And best to do that as we go along. So um, we just need to, we need to know who you asked to bid on your project, when it went out, how long, how long it was posted and so on. And this will all be laid out for you. Okay, are there going to be work items completed by an architect? If so, um, you can lay them out. What is that architect actually going to do? Are they going to develop plans and specs for re-roofing, masonry repair and window repair perhaps? Are they going to assist with the bidding process? And are they going to oversee construction? Just some things that an architect might do for you. Using Are you using um, architect or engineer only if you, um, want to be reimbursed by HTF grant, um, would you include it in our project? But most of all, if you are going to use that, define what you want them to do for you and provide an estimated cost and the dates of their services.
projects that involve simple repairs and replacement um, in kind, um, let's see, generally not, not everything requires an invitation to bid. So um, we'll work with you on it. If you have a question, please ask. We include this just as a great example of a project schedule, a budget and scope of work. I'll be happy to share this PowerPoint with you so you can look at it again. So things are clearly laid out, defined by timeline and cost. Of course, those things may change, but still this gives you the overall plan for your project, the contingency, if you're using consultant fees or not, your total project cost and your grant request amount. Okay, photography. So you can share 20, approximately 20 photos of your project if you would like, but we would like one photo to be the context of your project. Um, this is a three corner angle shot. It's a pretty picture of your building. If your project is a building, um, it shows the front and a side elevation. So this kind of gives um, a great introduction with, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and I think it is here. So help the reviewers um, know what your project is about. And then more detail on other photographs. You can show close-ups of the damage and deterioration that's happening. You can add arrows and circles and um, locate point things you want them to notice in a photograph. And every photograph needs to have be labeled clearly so the reviewer knows what they're looking at. It might be helpful sometimes to lay a ruler or a straight edge or uh, something like that to give perspective. Um, photos of buckets catching water leaking from roofs might be something you could show if you have a roof problem. Um, carpenters levels sometimes show uneven floors, for example. So try to think about how your photographs are going to help you explain to the reviewer what your project is. And drone um, photographs are becoming more, um, more common. And um, I understand that some local um, governments um, provide, um, they provide um, drone operators to take photos of buildings. So if you have a, a roof project or a project um, that's not easily seen from the street, you might want to um, figure out a way to get a drone shot of to show the reviewers, number one, just um, the full um, image of your building, but also um, some of the detail necessary for your project above. But when you're creating your photographs, don't make them too busy. Don't include too many things. So don't cover up every, um, every um, element of your building. Um, don't confuse the reviewers. This image is way too busy and we just uh, put it in there as an example of what not to do. Um, we want the uh, photos to help explain the project, to give some insight into the detail, to show the urgency of your project, for example. So um, don't overwhelm and confuse the reviewers. Okay, further thoughts. Have you convinced the grant reviewers that this is a, an important project that you are deserving of grant funds? We suggest that you have other people read, edit, maybe proof your application, um, proof your Word document that you're using to create um, the answers to your application. Um, other people, um, they might not know as much as you do. A reviewer might not be familiar at all with your project. So um, this is a helpful part of the process. And just um, the good news is, is whether or not your uh, project is funded, SHIPA will continue to provide technical advice to you whether or not your property receives an H HTF grant. Um, but overall, tell your story of your building. Um, but remember, 
you are competing with many others who will have equally important projects and you want to convince the reviewers that your project is the best. And let's see, I wish you um, the best of luck and I thank you for being involved in historic preservation work across the state of Kansas. Here's my contact information. Be happy to help you as we go along. And I believe we have some Q and A's and Katrina, I think is gonna come in and help us with that. Yes, um, Lauren and I have been trying to answer questions as best we can under the Q and A and the participants um, chat. Um, I think we have a couple more that we can answer, but um, I'm gonna go back through a couple of these because some of these were just um, directly to, to me or the panelists just in case anybody else had the same question. Um, a couple of people were asking if a project, if, if the grant funding is being requested for a specific part of the building, can they proceed with work on other parts of the building? Um, and the answer to that is yes, but we just want to remind you that we do have other funding programs such as the tax credit program that may be able to assist you with those other items. Um, and also keep in mind that um, we, of course, want all of the work on the building to meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. So um, we do offer that with a bit of caution to make sure that like if we grant fund something good on the building, that bad work isn't happening somewhere else that could negate your application. Um, so definitely kind of let us know what you might be working on or what you're intending to work on. Um, I will also say that um, part of that question was also related to um, the part of the application where we you were talking about the, the work line items and there's only six. Um, that's because we have limited that because we hope we want you to focus the grant application on the areas of the building where there is the most urgent need for um, funding. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not doing work in other parts of the building and then just applying for the grant for like the sixth or seventh or eighth thing down on your list <laughs> because the grant committee is gonna look at that and be like, oh, well, they've, they've already got the most important things covered, right? So we do, I do give you that with a grain of salt to say that like, obviously if the roof needs to be repaired this winter and you cannot wait until next spring. And so priority number one is the roof and it has to be done now, go ahead and work on the roof and then apply for the grant for the second thing on your list. Maybe that's the windows or the masonry or the foundation um, and explain that in your, the narrative part of your grant. Um, the grant committee in the past has responded pretty favorably to those kind of things. But for example, if your roof is leaking and you show us photos of the roof leaking, but your grant application is for a bathroom remodel, then they're going to question why are you asking for money for your bathroom when your roof is leaking? Um, a couple of other questions that came up. Someone was asking about how long it takes to get a property listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We estimate 12 to 18 months from the time that you initially ask us um, about listing to the time it gets on the board um, agenda because it does, it is, it is relatively like writing a, I would say a college or master level like history paper, maybe like a a thesis. <laughs> um, it's about a hundred hours or more of research and writing on your part to get that document ready. And then usually it takes several draft reviews on our part and all of those take, you know, 60 days in between. Um, so it, it can take a couple of years to get through the entire process. This isn't something that happens within a couple of months. Um, let me go through here and see if there's any other um, questions. Somebody asked about drawings or sketches. Um, that's not something that's required at the application phase, but we may need those later if you do get funded. Um, and it's something that requires either structural work or something where you are restoring um, 
or like recreating a missing feature, we definitely will need drawings to be able to approve whatever it is you're trying to rebuild. And if it's a structural issue, we definitely want to make sure there's an engineer or somebody on um, on the project to make sure it's going to be safe. Um, a couple other questions here. People were asking um, about support letters. If you have support letters from years in the years past, can you reuse those? Certainly, that's that's your um, that's that's your choice. Um, I wouldn't probably include them if they were more than a couple of years old. Um, but you know, certainly if they're from last year, or the, this previous year, you could reuse those, no problem. Um, Someone was asking about phasing work out. If you have sort of multiple phases to your project, could you apply this year for one phase and then next year for the second phase? You can do that. Um, I will say though that there's no never a guarantee of funding. So if you get funded this year, there's no guarantee that you would be funded the second year. Um, also, it depends on the scale of your project and what your budget is. The grant is a maximum of $100,000. So if your project, if your total project is $800,000, then applying this year for an $800,000 project, knowing you're only gonna get 100, doesn't really make a lot of sense. So you definitely wanna focus it down to what, you know, an 80%, $100,000 at an 80% would actually realistically look like. Um, and also if you don't have $800,000 to put into the project right now, then that there's no reason to apply for all of that in the first round. Um, there was a question or two about LLCs and um, how that works as property ownership. Um, LLCs can be nonprofit or for-profit. So an LLC as the property owner is completely fine. But if you are a for-profit corporation, a for-profit LLC, um, my, understand, my understanding how that works, um, then you would have to be reimbursed at the 50% level, um, whereas a any other LLC that's just sort of in it for, um, you know, a partnership or a private business or something like that would be um, an 80%. Those get a little complicated and we may have to divide hairs between for-profit corporation. I think the, what the legislator, legislature was looking at is like a developer, um, not just someone who's in a, per, you know, has a, has a small business kind of thing. Um, Bidding, um, we are not looking for bids at this stage when you're applying for the grant, um, but you should have some estimates in hand so that you can build a good budget and you know how much to ask for. Um, you definitely don't want to apply for a grant. Um, let's say you apply for a $50,000 grant and then you go out to bid after the award and you find out that all of the bids come back at 100000 um, in, the, in that case, you didn't ask for enough money. So we can't go back and award additional funds to that level. Um, so you definitely want to have realistic estimates at this point, but you don't have to have competitive bids. You will have to have competitive, at least you have to provide the opportunity for people to give you competitive bids um, once the grant is awarded. Do, 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 do. Um, someone asked about parcels. If a property is on one parcel in the eyes of the county, but two prop parcels or two properties on KHRI, what's the best way to apply? Um, and my response to that was we would look at the National Register nomination. Um, but also if those properties, let's say that the National Register does call them out as two separate properties but they were historically associated and they're they're owned by the same entity right now. Um, we have in the past done those under one HTF application. Um, I'm thinking specifically in New Lancaster, um, there was two properties, they sit right close to each other. They're owned by the same couple and we did those at the same time. Um, someone was asking about paying for consultants before the application is due, just purely for planning purposes. Would that be reimbursable by the grant? Unfortunately, no. Um, if you are incurring any services before the grant is awarded and the grant agreement is signed, those are not reimbursable expenses. 
Uh, we can get to a couple other ones here. Um, Lauren, shout out if somebody is asking something I need uh, that I miss. Um, yeah, we have a couple unanswered in the Q and A as well as the um, chat. So one in the chat is, uh, I assume it's okay to use another grant previously received as match for the Heritage Trust Fund grant. That is true. Um, there shouldn't be any, not that I can think of any limit on other grants, um, whether it's from a private foundation, another state grant, or even a federal grant would be okay to match um, this grant funding. Um, I see now someone asked about new HVAC systems. Would that be eligible? They are eligible. I will say that they just don't compete very well. Um, Using the example again, if I have a hole in my roof and water's coming in and you are applying for an HVAC system, they more than likely are going to fund my project over yours because mine is more of a urgent um, preservation need because water's coming in the building. Um, you would need to demonstrate, you know, the best to the best of your ability that this is an urgent need that rises to the level of preserving the building. Um, let's see here, going back to the Q and A, if the building received Heritage Trust Fund grant in the early 2000s by a different ownership group, are we eligible to apply now? Yes, indeed you are. Um, yeah, so basically they're just saying they have some structural issues that need to be addressed, but yes, you would be eligible. Um, even if it was the same ownership, you're eligible to apply again and again and again as many times as you want. Um, we have a, a seen funded in the past um, multiple grants to the same property, even the same property owner. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Um, someone is talking, asking about if the roof is leaking due to storm damage, do we have to apply? Do we have to? Do we have to apply for insurance benefits? We've been assured that this will result in higher premiums. That is between you and your insurance. I don't have any say in that, but um, that is something that maybe you could talk about in your grant application as to why you need the grant funding. Um, you're asking for the grant because even though you have insurance, you know that asking for a claim would actually raise your rates or cause cancellation, and that's a concern. I don't know how the grant committee will feel about that. I don't know if they'll take that as, you know, a reasonable, uh, a, a good reason for to fund the project, but I think that's worthy of, of explaining. Um, can we ask for consulting fees to make a good decision for restoration this year for a project we would be seeking funding for? Um, yes, um, consulting fees are an eligible HTF expense. Um, they usually are smaller dollar amounts. So sometimes that is attractive to the grant committee because at the end of their deliberations, if they have a little bit of money left over, not enough to fund a full preservation project, but a little bit that they can still give away, they will look for those kind of grants to fund um, I will say though that kind of like the HVAC question, it it doesn't always rise to the top as far as what preservation and urgency needs they're looking at. So um, you would kind of need to you know really play up that aspect of why you need that and why this is so urgent for you. Um, oh, in addition, they were also asking about trying to determine whether we should paint or our side a historic building next year. And so, yeah, those are like priorities that usually what we would fund because there does have to be a product for the grant, we would fund like a historic structure report or a preservation plan um, or a set of drawings or an engineering plans. So there would need to be some kind of tangible result of the um, grant if it was funded. Um, if you received insurance money for damages, like damage to a roof, can that amount be included as part of the 20% that the owner provides? Yes, because as Jan explained, you will have to pay the contractor 
100% of the construction cost and then seek reimbursement. So where you get that money from to pay the contractor is totally up to you. If that's your personal savings, that's a loan, that is insurance proceeds, that's donations. Um, as long as you can show us that the the contract, the, the contractor's invoice has been paid, then we can do the reimbursement um, at, you know, to you. Can an application be submitted for a property under contract but not closed by the grant due date? Technically, yes. Um, it would be very good to explain that in, um, in your application um, where it requires you to upload information about the property ownership. Um, because obviously you're not going to have documentation of you as the property owner, um, but you can include some kind of contract or document that shows that you are under contract. The kicker with that is if your project is chosen to be awarded, we can't actually sign a grant agreement with you until you are the property owner. And that may cause concern for the grant committee because um, we do have more applications than we have funding to give out. And they are one of the things that they're looking for is to be able to start the projects pretty quickly. Um, what they don't like to see um, for this case and others where match may not be in place is they don't want to award a grant in February and then have six months, a year of waiting for, um, you know, the, the grantee to get sort of all their ducks in a row. Um, so that could be a concern that you would need to address in your application. Um, we answered the question about, can other work be done on the property as long as there are not HTI items proposed? Yes, just keep in mind that there's sort of, we don't want you doing bad things to the building while you're trying to apply for good things. And don't forget about tax credits because those are there for you no matter what um, no, um, ap no competitive application that you have to apply for. You do have an application you need to submit. Anything I missed, um, go ahead and raise your hand or put, a, put another note in the chat. Um, can two people attend the orientation, although only one will be the actual administrator? Yes, indeed, please. <laughs> if you would like to bring along another set of eyes and ears to the orientation, we encourage that. Um, there is a barn on my property, or is that grant for the primary structure only? So properties that are eligible for this grant have to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places or be um, considered contributing to a listed historic district. So if you have like a farmstead, um, the farm is listed on the National Register, but the barn the house, the outbuildings may or may not be contributing to that property. So we would just have to look to see if the barn or whatever other outbuildings you're looking to include in the grant are actually contributors um, in the National Register nomination. And we can help you with that. Just let us know um, what property you're talking about and we can look that up for you. Perfect, yeah, it's contributing to the property, that would work great. And so, yeah, you could include work on both the house and the barn or the barn and the chicken coop or whatever other prop, you know, structures you have on the property, as long as they're all on the same property and they're all owned by you. Um, orientation, someone was asking about orientation. Orientation comes after you get the letter from us that says, congratulations, you have been awarded this grant. Um, Jan or somebody from our office will send out those letters and will say, um, if you still want this grant, <laughs> number one, you have to return something to us that confirms you still want it. Um, believe it or not, every once in a while, there are some cases where things have changed and someone is just not able or just not in um, interested in the grant anymore. Maybe they're just not in a position to, to um, administer it. Um, but we will then set up with you times um, for an orientation session. And since COVID, we've mostly been doing those online, but there's also an opportunity if you wanted to come in in person. 
Um, where do you find information about applying for the National Register? Um, we will post here, maybe- You um, can put a link Lauren, in the chat, yeah. Perfect, Lauren is gonna put that link in the chat. We have information on our website, um, kshs.org. And we have a page that says um, basically how to list your property on the register. We start with a preliminary worksheet that we ask you to fill out so that we can determine if your property is eligible for listing on the register. And then we give you more information from there. But basically, once it's been determined eligible, we ask you to fill out the um, nomination form. That's the form that I was saying is kind of like a college level history paper. Um, and then that nomination goes through a review process and it can take, you know, 12, 18 months or more to get through that process. Any other questions? Um, are historical missing elements competitive, like ceiling tin, specific flooring, staircases? They can be. I will say that probably exterior ones are more competitive than interior, just because the grant committee, when you look at a building, you look at the exterior first, and then you kind of move to the inside. Um, and then on the interior, there are primary areas, like the very first thing you see when you walk in, it might be the retail area of a commercial building. It might be the foyer or the lobby of a hotel. Um, or a house. So those areas are going to sort of have more importance and significance than the back staircase or something um, deep in the building. Um, but again, you're competing against other people whose windows are falling out. There's holes in the roof. The foundation is cracked. So you have to um, really make your case about why your project rises to the level of being funded over those. What else can we answer for you? Well, Jan's um, contact information is there. We have been recording this. We'll upload that to our website um, as soon as it's processed. And so if you do have questions later or questions as you work on your application, please just reach out to us. Um, Jan, Lauren, or I um, should be able to answer most of those questions. And if we can't figure it out, we will ask somebody that does. And we appreciate everyone coming to this online webinar today. Um, we look forward to seeing your applications. Thank you.